Our next speaker is Melissa Inoue. She earned her PhD in Chinese history from Harvard University, and she, her, the, uh, while researching and writing her dissertation, Miraculous Mundane, The True Jesus, Ch Jesus Church and Chinese Christianity in the 20th Century, she lived in China, and is affiliate of Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences from 2009 to 2010. It's the, her rest of her bio is very impressive. It's in your program. And with that short introduction, I'm going to turn the time over to Melissa. It's a pleasure and an honor to address this conference today. I'm a newbie at FAIR, so in preparing this talk, I paid close attention to this, the description on the conference website. This description identified three elements for conference presentations. A unique perspective on history, science, or theology, a desire to help discuss issues that are sometimes challenging to testimonies in faith, and information and answers needed to faithfully deal with criticisms leveraged against the church and gospel. The challenging issue I'd like to tackle today is gender. In a talk to CES teachers in 2016, Elder M. Russell Ballard said that the information age had changed a game of building faith in young people. He said, our, curricula our curriculum, though well-meaning, did not prepare students for today, a day when students have instant access to virtually everything about the church from every possible point of view. Today, what they see on their mobile devices is likely to be faith challenging as much as faith promoting. He identified gender issues as among today's challenging topics. This slide shows examples of the kinds of questions, themes, and memes pertaining to gender and the church that one often sees online. People comment on the absence of women compared to men in church texts and discourse. Of course, women have been part of the story of the restored church since the very beginning. If there had been no women involved in the restoration, Joseph Smith's movement wouldn't have gotten off the ground. If anything, there are probably more women members who participate in the church than men. But some people, especially young people, don't see women in our history. Whose problem is that? So take this little pop quiz. Take 30 seconds and see if you can name five women from church history. Tick them off on your fingers. Take 30 seconds. Can the audience here just show me? I just want to see. Sweet. This is a very well-prepared audience. So a while ago, some of my colleagues at the Church History Department made an informal survey asking the same question to adults attending gospel doctrine classes. Most couldn't come up with five names. Of those they remembered, the most frequently listed were Emma Smith, Eliza R. Snow, and that woman with the cow and the milk strippings. So I gave this quiz to my husband. When I asked him to name men, he easily rattled off a string of names, starting with the early church presidents, whose names we've enshrined in primary songs. But women were a blank space. Today's presentation about responding to concerns about gender issues at church has four parts. First, I'll share my perspective as a history of, historian of Christianity in China. Then I share information from people who frequently talk to young people about gender issues and actions that we're taking at the... Oh, and then I'll talk about actions we're taking at the Church History Department to address these concerns. Finally, I'll list some actions that all of us can take. So first, perspective. My mission in Taiwan had a lasting influence on my perspective. After my mission, I continued to study religion in China. I wrote a book on a Chinese restoration movement in China called The True Jesus Church. It's a study of someone who was a bit uncertain about which church was the right one, had a vision, saw Jesus, and was commanded by Jesus to restore the one true church in China in 1917. This study took me deep into the history of Christian missionary work in China, first with European missions and later with Chinese Christians doing their own missionary work. When European missions first were established in China, they struggled to find, the missionaries struggled to find the right Chinese word for God. For instance, the 16th century Catholics considered the word Shen 
which can be either plural or singular, god or gods or spirits. But they rejected it because it could also refer to petty deities or even personal spirits. They coined the term Kenju, Lord of Heaven. This word was entirely foreign, which meant that it couldn't tap into existing referential feelings. But then on the other hand, it didn't have to compete with other native religious associations. Now contrast this with the Protestant choice, Shang Di, God on High. The problem with this is that Shang Di was an actual name for an actual god in the Chinese religious pantheon, like Zeus. Here's a big statue of Shang Di in Taiwan. Multiple translations of the Chinese Book of Mormon wrestled with the gaps between English and Chinese terms. The earlier translation of the sacrament prayer Moroni starts off, Shang Di, Yong Hong De Fu. That means Shang Di, Eternal Father. But the more recent translation now uses Shen. Beyond written words, Christians in China also struggled to bridge a cultural gap when it came to visual images. So here we have two depictions of the story of the wealthy young man in Mark. The German and the Chinese illustrators of these paintings have both painted Christ and his followers, who were Middle Easterners, in their own German or Chinese national image. My guess is that if these two options, most of the members of this audience today would feel like the German Jesus is the right Jesus. It's what we're used to. But to the Chinese Christians, the slim, wispy bearded Jesus with the black hair was the Jesus who felt like Jesus to them. And they could see themselves in his followers. Very sensibly, instead of insisting on a European Jesus, local Christian ar chi Chinese artists represented the Savior with all the cultural cues and visual symbols that would align with Chinese expectations for a benevolent Savior who knew them and loved them. The retranslation of the Chinese language for God in the, in the Book of Mormon illustrates how hard it is to bridge cultural gaps. Sometimes you have to keep trying. The two pieces of artwork show how cultural differences are not just about folk dance and clothes. They extend to how people understand the divine and what they expect from it. Now, ignorance of cultural difference can be costly. When I was a new professor at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, I was assigned to teach a discussion class section in a lecture hall. It had rows and rows of seats with little desks. So to get the students to talk to each other, I wanted to organize them into clusters. I told them the students in the lower rows just sit on their desks. A young woman raised her hand a bit uncomfortably, and she said, actually, in Maori culture, sitting on a desk is tapu. It's one of the rudest things a person can do, like picking your nose before an audience or kicking a baby. Now, as an American, I had never seen a problem with table sitting, but in this setting, since I was trying to get this group of young people in New Zealand to pay attention to me and respect me, I must not sit on that table. It would distract from my message and detract from my credibility. These stories describe how effective communication depends on understanding and taking seriously gaps in culture that vary from place to place. Hard work is also required for bridging cultural gaps that grow between generations. The work of adapting to change in to changing times and to generational differences is part of the ongoing restoration in which we eagerly look for the great things that God has yet to reveal. In 1934, Joseph Fielding Smith, then an apostle, later president of the church, addressed a conference of leaders concerned about faith crises among young Latter-day Saints. At this time, many were disillusioned about the clash between contemporary scientific understandings about the earth and how it was formed and a literal reading of the Bible, and many people didn't see a way forward. But Elder Smith declared, frequent reorientation in church teachings was necessary as horizons, horizons of human knowledge and experience broadened. He said, what was adequate for Moses' time was not adequate for Christ's. What was adequate for the prophet Joseph's time is not adequate for ours, and our grandchildren's world will find our, inter our interpretations inadequate their world will have so changed that fundamental truth, in order to function for their benefit, will have to be interpreted in light of their needs and problems. Now, Elder Smith would be 144 years old today. The grandchildren of whom he spoke are now grandparents. The onus, he says, is on the older generations to engage with the needs and problems of the younger generations. So now let's take a closer look at these needs and problems. Latter-day Saint historian Artis Partial took a look at the indexes of popular church histories and counted women who were named therein. In the 1970, Joseph Smith and the Restoration, the percentage of named women was 7%. Since 
the story of the Latter-day Saints was 8.5%. By rough stone rolling, the biography of Joseph Smith by Richard Bushin, in 2005, it was 15%, seven men to each one woman. Now, if the trend continues at this rate, it will be 2189 before we have histories that discuss women and men in normal 50-50 ratios. Now, the absence of women from history, records, and discourse in general is a problem found all over the world called the gender data gap. One study of U.S. high school history textbooks from 1960 to 1990 found that only 9% of the names in the indexes were women. A 2015 worldwide study of newspaper, television, and radio news found that women made up only 24% of the named persons therein. A 2013 study of films and TV found the ratio of male to female characters in family films was 2.5 men to one woman. It's not the case that historically there have been no ta talented or noteworthy women, no women whose contributions were worth remembering. Barbara Strozzi, an Italian composer during the Baroque era, had more music in print in her lifetime than any other composer of the era. She was kind of like the Beatles or Elvis Presley, the group and artists with the most albums in the second half of the 20th century. Now, perhaps because she was a singer as well as a composer, most of Barbara Strozzi's work is written for the unaccompanied female voice. Her father was a poet, and perhaps because of his influence, Strozzi's work is known for the way the musical inflections are intimately tied to the words of the text. You can hear this in her solo cantata setting of a poem, Lagrima Mia, in which the first line of the text reads, Tears of mine, what holds you back? Why don't you give vent to the fierce pain that takes away my breath and weighs on my heart? Here's a one minute clip. Can the audience hear this clip? I have a YouTube link, so if our technical um, people can't figure this out, then you can watch it for yourself on YouTube after this performance. There's another clip further on in the presentation, which also requires audio from the PowerPoint. So when you hear this clip, um, you will be able to appreciate the remarkable, um, the beauty of the, her compositions. And it will lead us to wonder, why haven't we heard these things before? Few people have heard of Barbara Strozzi, the Elvis of the 17th century. Her teacher and contemporary, Francesco Cavalli, is well known. As a man, he was able to get a job at St. Mark's in Venice as head of music. This position was not open to women. And this gave him steady financial resources. With these resources, he paid for his works to be kept in a library and cared for by an archivist. He also paid for his masses to be sung on the anniversary of his death. No wonder Cavalli's name was preserved over centuries and Strozzi's fell from public remembrance. Without being accusing or argumentative over why history has so many more references to men than women, we can simply acknowledge that this is the fact. Of course, for many centuries, and indeed most of recorded history, this foregrounding of men, men's activities, and men's words seemed only natural, to the point that even today, learning about the gender data gap is surprising. It's kind of crazy when you really think about it, to think that for centuries people have assumed that history that should be recorded included only stories about activities that at the time were mostly limited to men, like being a head of state, or being a soldier, or being a pope. We now realize that political, military, and ecclesiastical activities are not the only things worth understanding and remembering. This is why we do family history, of course. A person doesn't have to be a head of state to make a difference. We seek them out and tell their stories because they are our own. What do we lose when we leave women out of our history? In the first place, we leave the gifts, lose the gifts they have shared, their talents, discoveries, insights, and sacrifices. In the second place, we run the danger of having a skewed view of reality, not knowing who we really are as children of God. Women's stories and lives are not niche. Half of us, after all, are women. Dr. Valerie Hudson, who was a mechanic in the Special Forces before she was a renowned political scientist, says that from a military point of view, the gender data gap signifies, quote, a failure to cultivate situational awareness. You are making worse decisions when you don't have a complete understanding, and you will never have a complete understanding without consulting women, close quote, and of course, including women in the picture. 
The third thing we lose when we leave women out of our history is proof that you can be a strong, intelligent, path-breaking woman and also a Latter-day Saint. In 2001, President Gordon B. Hinckley told the young women, quote, the whole gamut of human endeavor is now open to women. You can include in the dream of the woman you would like to be a picture of one qualified to serve society and make a significant contrib contribution to the world of which she will be a part. This generation has taken President Hinckley's advice and run with it. They have also sharpened awareness of gender issues. They count where women are present and absent. If our young women don't see themselves in our history, how can they see themselves in our future? Gender issues don't concern young women only. Rachel Cope, a professor in the Religious Education Department at BYU, said, in recent years, both men and women had approached her, troubled by what they saw in terms of gender in the church. She says, one semester I had more male students come into my office concerned about gender temple language and women's absence from formal roles at church than I did female students. They had questions about practices that felt wrong and looked wrong to them. Without opining on what gender compositions are ideal or whether certain situations naturally produce particular gender ratios, we can observe that young people pay close attention to the presence and absence of women and see sexism as incompatible with something true and godly. As my friend Aaron McPhee put it in a popular article from Meridian Magazine, young people today are eagle-eyed at spotting sexism, which they regard as morally disgusting. She says, we can be sure that our youth are on high alert for sexism and that when they find it, it pains them. It blunts the needed impact of our teaching, obscures the light of divine standards in their lives, and may even frustrate them so much they don't ever get past the wrapping to see what's inside. The heart of the restored gospel is our faith in Jesus Christ. But if young people look at our church histories and see sexism, it makes it harder for them to see Christ here too. Now at this point, someone who doesn't currently share these concerns might say, who cares about appearances? In our church, we've been taught to care about appearances very much, particularly the appearance of evil. This appearance of evil shifts in every age and place. Not too long ago, people might have zealously measured dress hemlines as a litmus test for righteousness. Now, many young people's morality litmus tests measure sexism along with racism and other social issues. Appearances matter in missionary work as well. Missionaries representing Jesus Christ adopt tidy grooming and demeanor that facilitates respect for their message. When we write the history of the church that bears a Savior's name, we owe it to him to not present him in a slovenly way that makes his church look sexist or otherwise dismissive of whole groups of God's children. In sum, not caring about whether the stories we tell at church seem sexist is kind of like having spinach stuck in one's front teeth. It may not bother us, we may not even notice it, but it makes people looking at us take us less seriously. If it doesn't do violence to the core gospel truth of Christ's atonement, and if it makes young people better able to hear the Savior's voice. Why not pick the spinach out? So let's talk about how we can take action. First, I'll talk about what we are working on at the Church History Department, and then I'll make some suggestions about what all of us can do. At the Church History Department, we strive to serve the whole global church. We are working hard to keep records and write histories that acknowledge the saints' diverse experiences. We're working to narrow the gender gap by publishing work that shows women's dynamic contributions in building Zion. At the forefront of this effort are the global histories, histories of ordinary Latter-day Saints all around the world. And at this point, I'd like to make a note that all over the world, gender issues are very different for people depending on their situation. Because of the composition of the audience I'm speaking to today, educated people in Western post-industrial societies, my talk today primarily discusses a particular sort of gender complaint the perception that women have relatively less visibility in a church setting than in surrounding society. In many other places and cultures around the world, however, with very conservative gender norms, the proclamation on the family may read like a revolutionary feminist document, and the situation looks very different. I'll speak some more about this at the end of my talk. Now, if you go to the Global History section of the Gospel Library, you'll see stories like the story of Elizabeth Xavier Tate. I'll draw on the version that's currently online with other stories from India. Elizabeth was born and raised in India. Her great-grandfather was Portuguese. She married William Tate, a British man. The two of them joined the church in 1852. 
In 1855, they joined a group of saints who were making their way across the Pacific Ocean and from there to Utah. But at the last minute, Elizabeth's mother prevented her from getting on the ship, and the ship sailed without her. Elizabeth booked passage on the next ship, even though it was bound across the Atlantic Ocean for New York City instead. After arriving in New York, Elizabeth made the journey across the eastern United States with her infant daughter, who died in Iowa. After burying her baby, Elizabeth crossed the plains with the Willie Handcart Company. She survived the journey and was reunited with her husband when he and other members of the rescue party rushed out to bring the Willie and Martin companies in from the plains. William and Elizabeth Tate settled in Cedar City with their son, where Elizabeth taught school and raised seven more children. Fantastic. She's amazing. And yet, it's no longer enough to tell faith-promoting stories. We must be able to cite faith-promoting data. My colleague Ryan Saltzgiver and a team of missionaries and interns who launched the Global Histories Project wanted to have situational awareness. As we know from research on the gender data gap, things can feel equal but turn out to be really unequal when we actually count. They put together a spreadsheet that tracked how many of the stories of faith in global histories mentioned women by name, showed women taking action as opposed to just being mentioned as someone's wife, for instance, or featured women as the chief protagonist, the point of view character or co-protagonist. They also counted total numbers of women and men in the indexes. In the first round of counting, the first, uh, after the first 40 places had been written up from Argentina to Wales, this is what they got. 70% of the stories had at least one woman who appeared and was mentioned by name. 44% of stories depicted women taking action. 14% of stories listed women as a point of view protagonist. 12% of the stories listed a woman as a co-protagonist, often with a husband. Women were 26% of the named individuals, including names from that country's chronology, kind of a list of important events um, in the whole history of the church in that place. In terms of being a normal, natural representation of women, it wasn't super, it was just over halfway there. But compared to women in the 20th century U.S. history textbook study or the global media project study, it was better representation than either. Remember, it was 9% and 24%. Now, in the second batch of counting, after we'd kind of been working harder to include women, uh, after another nine histories had been written up, this is what we see. This time, 83% of the stories had women appearing mentioned by name. 74% of the stories have women taking action. This improves on... Um, 44% in the first batch, and brings the average up to 50%. Women were a point of view protagonist in 20% of the stories, which is better than 14, brings the average up to 15%. Women were co-protagonists in 33%, uh, bringing us up to 16%, but still, women were 26% of named individuals. And if you look at the, um, the spreadsheet, it shows how, you know, this was probably because there are a ton of men named in our stories on South Africa, Russia, Romania, and Denmark. So just before this conference, I took a look at the third batch of histories in the queue, the most recently written stories waiting to be published. It wasn't all the histories in the queue, it's just the first 16 out of 24. So in these, a woman was named in 87% of the stories. A non-protagonist woman took action in 57% of the stories, bringing the average up to 51%. A woman was the point of view protagonist in 36% of the stories, bringing the average up to 19% and a co-protagonist in 45%, bringing this up to 22%. And in this last batch, women were 28% of the named individuals, which brought the total average up one percentage point to 27%. So just 1%. So there's two morals to this story. One, uh, the skew in the historical records themselves is really hard to overcome. Most of, this is because most of the mission records are the kind of internal bureaucratic correspondence of North American mission administrators or missionary leaders written for the Salt Lake City leaders. So essentially men talking to men about male activities. And in the chronologies we have a lot of major events which are administrative, like a new branch being created or um, a new stake being created or a high-ranking leader visit. They're all centered around changes in priesthood office holding. Another source of the skew is these records are usually written in English with kind of inconsistent romanizations of native languages, so it's hard to get people's actual names in their local languages. And there's also infrequent recording of female leaders, such as the presidents of Relief Society, young women, and primary. 
But the second moral to the story is that even given the limitations in the sources, it is possible to narrow the gender data gap by digging a little bit more. Just by exercising a little accountability, the Global Histories team went from 14% of stories with women as a point of view protagonist to 36%. Individual stories have more inherent flexibility and less of the structural limitations than a chronology of important church events. And here, it's possible to make a real difference. So let me show you what this kind of digging looks like. I'll share examples from Germany in the late 1920s and 1940s and Hong Kong from the 1950s and 1960s. This is the minute book of the Dresden Relief Society. It's written in beautiful handwriting in a book with this. Um, in a book that has very sturdy, thick pages that make a nice sound when you turn them. I've taken a video, so hopefully it works. If it doesn't, I'm sure we can upload the, vi the video to the FAIR website later on. I don't hear the beautifully sound, sound of the turning pages, but it's a really nice sound. So if you look at this um, handwriting in the minute book, there's also one more slide that has video and sound. If you look at the handwriting, you can see the care that was taken in these minute books. Um, the people clearly copied down their notes in normal note paper and then copied it into the book in beautiful writing. You can see, oh wow, you can hear it. Great job, guys. Nice crackle sound of the pages. So satisfying. So wonderful. Um, so these sources also give us photos tucked into the back page. And when you look through them, again, appreciating this beautiful writing, they give us not only the names of women leaders like Mission President Eliza Tadja and President Sister Radishel, they also give us their titles. Both women were referred to respectfully as president. Because the congregations were small and women outnumbered men in Dresden in the late 1920s, there were many more active female tithe payers than male tithe payers. Relief society activities were often the de facto activity of the entire unit. This meeting is listed as taking place under the presiding authority of President Sister Radishel, but with male members such as the branch president in attendance. This is a record from the Relief Society in the, in the city of Cologne, Cologne. This first record here is produced around the same time as the Dresden record book, just before the Great Depression spread around the world and pledged the German economy into a downward spiral which helped fuel the rise of the Nazi party. During this time in Cologne, families lived five to a room with one bed and heated with coal picked from ash heaps. Children went without school books, winter coats, or even decent underwear. Some in Cologne's south side went barefoot. During this difficult time, the Relief Society women held working hours knitting and selling socks to support themselves and each other. You can see this in their budget, um, how they, they mention uh, the money that they made from their sock sales as well as the outlays for support. As they did this, uh, their handwork, they sang and read poetry and literature. Here's another uh, sheet of their budgets, um, and we kind of mine these to look at the activities and um, the things that they were doing. So here in December 1930, in the middle of the Depression, the 18 sisters in the Cologne Relief Society also had an offering that raised 95 marks, which was about a month's salary for a working woman for the support of the people in need. Here in December 1930, uh, we show that they're still working hard, uh, doing stuff, buying wool, making things, but they also pooled their resources so they could have a Christmas party. Their expenses are listed as wool, Christmas party provisions, Christmas presents, and stage props. Skipping ahead to 1948, this welfare report from after the World War II lists the items that Relief Society members made together, meeting on Monday afternoons, noting, the undertaking of the members was the desire of the members and brought much joy. It produced 15 bras, two children's shirts, two boys' shirts, six girls' underwear, five aprons, six slips, eight hats, three hairstylists' cloaks, two dresses, three pairs of house shoes for children, two pairs of house shoes for adults, nine women's underwear, six caps, one hood, 40 handkerchiefs, two pairs of leggings, one child's jacket, one pillow, two children's blouses, one plush vest, four rugs made out of old socks. Now in this lively list, we see the industry, ingenuity, and care of the women of the Dresden Relief Society. The old socks are converted into useful rugs. The hairstylist cloak could be used to earn additional income. Even in war, hair keeps growing. 
except for mine. And they also made things for women, like bras and slips. This report from 1948 comes on the heels of a desperate time in the Dresden Saints' lives, the months and years after the end of the war, when Germany was utterly devastated and food was in short supply. Money was worthless and many died of hunger. In these post-war years, one Latter-day Saint woman named Ilse Kaden from the Dresden Ward kept her family from starvation by trading knitted jackets for a sack of flour. She darned socks of dairy farmers for milk, cheese, and eggs. The Relief Society culture of handwork on behalf of others had saved their own families as well. The church was established in Hong Kong in 1955. Most church members were refugees. And you can see this huge influx of people into Hong Kong. The population in 1945 was 600,000. But by 1950, five years later, it had swelled to 2 million and 3 million in 1960. Um, at the peak of the migration, there were 1,000 new refugees a day. And people were living in squatter settlements on hillsides in very temporary um, shelters. So these mission records from this time can be hard to penetrate, especially when you're looking for women. They were written by North American mission presidents. They primarily focus on missionary transfers and statistics and don't really talk about women's activities. We can catch a few sentences here and there. For instance, in the Tsim primary, some difficulties experienced because of distances which some of the children must come alone. Now digging further, we found a personal rep reminiscence by Hong Kong's first local full-time missionary, Nora Coote. We, she tells a story of how she and her companion collected children from a rural settlement and brought them to a church activity in the city. By the end of the activity, it was late, pitch dark, and the children's homes were far away. So Sister Coote had them sleep over, boys and girls, in the missionary apartment. Her North American companion wrung her hands. Ah, oh, we're breaking so many mission rules. But everything turned out fine. We ran into the usual gender data gap with the story of Ning Jing, a former Nationalist Army field commander, and his wife, who had come to Hong Kong as refugees. Ning Jing was listed in the mission record. His family was baptized in 1958. He and his wife got a $75 microloan from the Hong Kong mission to start a noodle factory. They sold noodles out of their apartment. But what was his wife's name? We reached out to local members in Hong Kong, and they remembered her name. So now she's there in the history as a person in her own right. The Hong Kong Temple is a famous part of Hong Kong history and a temple history, with this unusual story as the first multi-purpose temple in the world. This story features President Hinckley waking up in the middle of the night, drawing a picture of the temple, and consulting with many local leaders. It's a wonderful story, but there aren't many women in it, and so we look for a way to bring them in. We found and included the story of another way in which the Hong Kong Temple made temple history, by pioneering the first Sunday temple worship. Many of the church members in Hong Kong are women from the Philippines or Indonesia who work as live-in domestic helpers. It's demanding work, they only get a day off every week, and this day is set by their employer. Sisters whose day off falls on Sunday are never able to attend the temple because the temple was closed on Sundays. One day, local leaders thought to ask up the chain whether accommodations could be made for them. In March 2014, it was announced that the Hong Kong Temple would be open on Sunday, once every quarter, to allow these sisters to access temple worship. Faye Marzan, Relief Society President of the Peninsula Third Ward, was there on that first Sunday session. She remembers, the room was filled with happy saints. Our eyes met, and we couldn't hold back the tears flowing down on our cheeks. One global history with very recent content is the story of Iso Ikponwe, born in 1954. Her father was determined that all of his nine children should be well-educated. Her mother, Diana, who was illiterate, also was determined, supporting them as they focused on their studies. Iso com completed studies in law at the University of Nigeria, in Nugu. She and her husband, Edward, both built successful careers and had five children. In 1992, when Isok was serving as a magistrate in Edo State, she visited her mother's home and found her nieces and nephews reading the Book of Mormon to her mother. She confronted her brother, who had brought the book home, told him it was a dangerous book. He told her the book and the church that had given to, given to him were good, but she remained unconvinced. Later, Isok found that her mother was learning to read. The church that had given them the Book of Mormon also organized literacy courses. Her mother was now able to read the scriptures and write letters to a daughter who had immigrated. Seeing her mother so happy, Isolf began to reconsider her assumptions about the church. There must be something there, she thought. 
Iso investigated the church for more than a year. Eventually, she decided to be baptized. She has served both as president of her stakes relief society and chief judge of the High Court of Edo State in Nigeria. She was known for her integrity. She was also known for being a Latter-day Saint. After her swearing-in ceremony, when reporters asked her about her attitude toward her work, she quoted King Benjamin, When ye are in the service of your fellow beings, ye are only in the service of your God. This short video clip from 2019 shows a ceremony to commemorate her retirement as a judge. It was a colorful valedictory ceremony as retired and serving justices, senior advocates of Nigeria, the clergy, palace chiefs, family members, friends and well-wishers came to celebrate the outgone chief judge of Edo State, Justice Esoe Ikmome, on the occasion of her retirement. Retired Justice Esoe Ikmome is a fellow of the Commonwealth Judiciary Education Institute, fellow of the Nigerian Institute of Chartered Arbitrators, and fellow of the Institute of Chartered Mediators and Conciliators, amongst others. She heard various positions before reaching her zenith as the chief judge of Edo State. Best in Bire reporting. Isoi is one of the highest ranking Latter-day Saint judicial officials in the world, along with Christine Durham, who is chief justice of the Supreme Court of Utah State in the United States. A prestigious scholarship has been established in Isoi's name to mentor young female lawyers. So we in the Church History Department are working hard to publish better histories. Now it's your job to read them and use them. Here are some action items that will help everyone respond to the criticism that women are missing from our church history with knock-on effects for our church culture. This gender gap is not born of malicious or domineering intent. It simply reflects a long-standing pattern in human history which naturally shaped patterns in church history. But now we know about this gap in our records and storytelling. Now we know that significant gender gaps make it hard for young people to believe that this particular church compared to all the other churches and religious traditions sailing on the wide sea of possibility, is where God wants them to be. It does not diminish, it does not diminish the Savior's atonement, one wit to fill the blank spaces in our history and in our consciousness with women's contributions and women's discipleship. On the contrary, the Savior's teaching compels us to reckon with times we have buried women's talents in the ground instead of multiplying and distributing them for the glory of Christ. We can resolve to take the new journey is needed to feed his sheep in this generation. Action item one, amplify women's voices. I really, really love the recent publication at the pulpit, a compilation of Latter-day Saint women's discourses. A talk in Mexico City in 1972 by Lucretia Suarez de Juarez has a beautiful story that someone should make into a short animation. A talk on suffering at BYU in 1986 by Francine Benyon is one of the most powerful discourses I've ever encountered in our entire church tradition. And um, if you Mis want, you can hear her speaking. The uh, discourses in the pulpit are online. significativo es para todas nosotras pensar que en muchos lugares del mundo. Action item number two: account and be accountable. Count. Notice situations where women's voices, talents, and perspectives are weirdly absent. If you see something, say something. Ward councils, sacrament meeting lineups, special youth fireside programs, church history, conference talks, all these kinds of things. Number three, don't miss missionary opportunities to highlight the strength of women in Latter-day Saint theology and history. Latter-day Saints believe Eve was wise and took initiative. We believe that we are children of a loving Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother. Hammer these points home. And remember that at church, it is the youth who are the real investigators. Action four, um, name drop. So we need to use women's names a lot so we remember them. Maybe the next time you're climbing a mountain, you can say, Elizabeth Xavier Tate crossed two oceans in one continent. I can do this. Or, we still have a mile to go. Pick up the pace. Elizabeth Xavier Tate could do it. People who are talented should write primary songs about Elizabeth. And also about Jane Manning James and Eliza R. Snow and Emmeline Wells and Martha Hughes Cannon. You might feel some trepidation like, well, will it be a problem to have the boys singing a song about women or memorizing women's names? And at this point you should ask, have the girls ever had a problem singing songs about men or memorizing men's names? Songs about women might sound weird and edgy, 
but that's just because we're used to the gender data gap. Half of everyone is neither weird nor edgy. Uh, number four, five, study, um, use resources. And we can see the church history department, there are a number of published things. Most of these are also online. There are wonderful resources in our new mottos for youth. I am a beloved daughter of heavenly parents. Um, President Nelson started talking about the phrase, the covenant path back home to our heavenly parents in April 19. So um, if President Nelson can do it, we can all do it. In Saints Volume 1, I did a little count, thanks uh, of the women in the index, and they have 17% of women as a point of view protagonists, which is pretty close to the global history's percentage right now of 19%, and 39% of the people in their win index are women, which is fantastic. And probably, I'm going to... I'm going to guess that a lot of the reasons why, um, when people were able to come up with names, hopefully many people were remembering names from saints. There's also Discourses of Eliza R. Snow that was online. You can search this. Um, so it's really fantastic. OK, um, okay, this is now action item five. Sorry, I lost track. You can write um, help with writing local histories of your branch or district or state. So often, we historians trying to write histories find bare bones unit records that list only proceedings of ward conferences, changes in callings, and notes about the occasional visiting speaker from Salt Lake. They're like the historical sources equivalent of a never ending, pre recorded telephone message. But occasionally, we find things that are delightful, like stories about what the local saints are up to, and detailed descriptions with names, especially of women tearing it up at Linger Longers, youth camps, and stage productions. Being called as a ward or branch historian is often a thankless, lonely task. I've never heard of someone who refused the offer of free additional primary sources or help. <laughs> it's like being a nursery leader. Action item number six. If you're a woman, write your own story. If you're a woman, you might also say, but is it self-promoting? Given the severity of the gender data gap in history, I would say it's self-preserving. Women are up against powerful forces of disappearance. Help out some hardworking future historian. Don't make them dig and dig and dig to find the fact that you exist. Your gifts and hard-won experience must not be lost, like the work of Barbara Strozzi, the Elvis Presley of the 17th century. I've spoken warningly of the negative effects of women's absence, but I should also mention the positive effects of Latter-day Saint women's presence. I feel so awesome by association to know of the accomplishments of Iso Ikponwe, a renowned judge and pioneer for women, and my sister in the gospel. She chose this church on her own terms after seeing its good fruits and has used it as a springboard for service to others. I feel so devastated by association to know the privations of Ilse Kaden and those sisters in the Dresden branch in the years after World War II. It's common to speak of Nazi Germany as one big horrible clump of people, but I can't think of Germany during this time without remembering my Latter-day Saint sisters and wondering what it felt like to be swept up into the currents of nationalism, totalitarianism, and war with mouths to feed. There are aspects of human experience that come to us all in the pattern of women's lives that differ from the pattern of men's lives and enrich us all. Earlier, I noted that gender issues are tied to local cultural realities and vary depending on when you, where you are in the world and in the church. What's seen as a problem for women in one space is not necessarily seen as a problem for women in another. Speaking personally as an individual, I find this global perspective healthy and helpful. It's not a silver bullet for gender-driven faith crises, but it does inspire humility, which is always useful. I'm looking for my last page. There are innumerable cultures and societies beyond the narrow audience that I address today. I do believe in the existence of universal values that transcend culture, but I freely acknowledge that my understanding and experience are limited. What I love about the women I see in global histories is how little we have in common in terms of our everyday cultural assumptions, yet how much we share in terms of our covenants to follow Christ and bear one another's burdens. In sum, I would like to leave you with testimony. Sometimes testimony means saying, 
I believe X and I know Y, with the assumption that if you say you believe X and know Y, a listener will also believe X and know Y. Sometimes this is how it works. But it doesn't work to change the situation that causes some to be concerned about gender issues. Testimony can also mean offering evidence to be weighed and considered. This, by their fruits you shall know style of testimony, is the kind of testimony we need with regard to difficult gender issues. If we aspire to teach about Jesus Christ in the information age, we must not give his church the appearance of evil through careless disregard or prideful ignorance of women's experiences and concerns. We must and shall provide young people with better evidence that women belong and flourish within the restored gospel of Jesus Christ historically and in the present. We must be accountable for the presence of women in the center of our bookshelves, lessons, and cultural references. Like learning a new language or culture, it will take time or effort. It will make us occasionally feel dumb and vulnerable. But now we have great historical resources and great direction from the leaders of the church. I do believe God has brought us together in these confusing times and mortal circumstances to learn from each other's wide experiences and learn to be repairers of the breach. I do know the gift of the atonement, which allows us to leave behind the things that encumber our spirits and find a new life. As we strive to see our fellow strangers as children of heavenly parents, our true sisters and brothers, we will become equal to our task and bring forth fruits worthy of the Savior's name. Thank you. That's fine. <laughs> so, yeah, we're, you're socially distanced from me, so we don't have to... You're good. You're good. Thank you very much for that uh, presentation. I thought it was really, really interesting. I thought it was good. And uh, with that, we did have some technical problems, so I've asked our technical support people if they can play that sound clip, because I'm always interested in sound clips. Fantastic. So, so here we go. Here's the sound clip. Thank you, thank you, that was wonderful. Reminds me, I have to give a shout out with, with your conversation, I have to give a shout out to my um, son and daughter-in-law who are both Hong Kong opera singers. So, yeah, they're based in That's Hong Kong. That's fantastic. Yeah. Are they singing Western opera or Chinese opera? Western opera. Western opera. You know, they have to have the Western guy in some of the plays, they, the operas they have there, so they, they, they do that. Right. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. And we were able to visit with them uh, in December to, uh, and we saw the, uh, uh, the, the Filipinas in the, in the chapel there. And it was just, it was an amazing experience. It was good. Mm. It was really good. So I do have some questions the audience has uh, given to us. So this is your inquisition time. <laughs> so the first question is, 
Do you believe the removal of mention of polygamous wives in handbooks about the presidents of the church hinders or helps appropriate view of, of the role of women in the church? So when the presidents of the church handbooks came out or the manuals came out a few years ago, um, the, um, the writer was telling me, me that many of the polygamous wives were not mentioned. Maybe some of the first wives were, but none of the other wives. Good, bad, what are your thoughts on that? I think Claudia Bushman put it really well when she said, those women paid the price then, and they pay the price now. I think we should remember who they are. They made a huge sacrifice um, because they were trying to follow Christ and gain eternal life. That's good. So what are your thoughts about the gender ratios of men and women in the New Saints volumes, and how does it compare with previous histories? Right, so I did mention this um, in that last slide. So I think Saints is doing a fantastic job of trying to bring women into the stories. And what I love about Saints is that it, you know, you kind of have to spend a lot of time with someone to remember their name. And what I love about it is, you know, for example, like Louisa Pratt uh, and the other characters in Saints, they, they come back over and over again. You check in with them throughout the whole volume. And that's really wonderful. So I gave my dad... Um, the five name five women from church history quiz and he was able to do it by drawing on his newfound knowledge from having read saints so i think that the team is doing a great job and they're really paying attention to this um, it was jed woodworth who gave me the 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 numbers that i use in my presentation because they're paying attention to those numbers as well excellent yes so the church history department has been very focused on bringing us women's stories recently and it's wonderful the curriculum department seems to lag behind. How can we move this knowledge into mainstream teaching instead of only in places we have to go looking for it? Well, um, advising the curriculum department is way above my pay grade. But what I think we can do is we can, you know, in Latter-day Saint settings, we are usually the lay teachers. Um, we are, in many ways, our own curriculum in our family home evenings, in our Come Follow Me discussions with our families, and even in Sunday school. You know, people bring in things that they've read or quotes that they like or other talks to supplement what's already there. So there's just so many resources out there. And I should have mentioned this in my presentation, but, you know, some of them have been explicitly produced to remedy this thing. Like The Witness of Women is a Deseret Book publication that um, talks about women in church history so that when you're talking about church history, you'll have this great resource to plug women in at every single point. Uh, and there's some really cool experiences in that book that aren't, um, that we should all know about because they're, you know, faith promoting and awesome. That's excellent. Um, here's another question. Um, it says, Melissa, you have an impressively extensive scope of the church internationally, especially as it pertains to Asia and the Pacific. What more can you tell us about the growth, progress, and challenges of the church in the PRC that is not already known via the church news? That's also way above my pay grade. <laughs> That's fine. That's a... While we can improve women representation in future publications, how can women better see themselves in ancient scripture canons such as the Book of Mormon? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I think there's, there's two answers to that. One is that it's just simply a fact there aren't a lot of stories about women in the Book of Mormon. Or, you know, Nephi's wife probably had a name, but it's hard to remember her because we just remember her as Nephi's wife. Um, the second aspect of that, though, is people have done a really good job in kind of mining that, those stories. I really like just, just the children's book, the Girls Who Love God series, where it talks about women in the Book of Mormon. And they point out that there are women throughout the Book of Mormon. They're, they're at the Waters of Mormon. They're there when King Benjamin speaks and they say, um, you know, what's the desire of their hearts? So um, we can point them out and, and just be a little creative in how we tell those stories. We don't have to make things up. Clearly women were there. We just have to um, realize that they're there but they don't have names and, and do what we can to mitigate that. Okay, very good. This is kind of a long question, but I'm going to read it anyway. So it said, I understand why we continue to talk about gender disparity in church history and society. I recognize that my wife and I are older, in our 60s, but we have seen in our lifetime how efforts to equalize the genders, at least in society at large, 
have led to greater emphasis on women's role in politics, business, leadership, etc., and has minimized their far more important role as mothers. This affects both genders, since men are one of the products and, and causes of these disparities. In spite of many of our seven children having left the covenant path, my wife still feels that her greatest contribution was in being able to be a stay-at-home mom. How do we balance? No, long, long question. So the question is asking, how do we balance emphasis on people's different roles? Yeah, I think what they're saying is, is we're emphasizing leadership roles, business politics of women, and it seems to have a de-emphasis on raising children, which is important for all of our children, both male and female. So how do we, how do we, how do we, how do we help women contribute more to society while still allowing and giving um, encouragement to be good mothers and wives and those types of things? Right. Well, I think that, at least that's how I'm interpreting his question. That's right. obviously, yeah, anyway. I guess I have two responses to that. I mean, number one, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, uh, Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, they were all fathers. All fathers, yes. I was thinking of that too. Um, the second thing is, I think President Hinckley's talk, um, which I quoted in my presentation, is relevant. He said, the whole gamut of human endeavor is open to women, you can make a contribution uh, to society and make and build society. So I don't think that President Hinckley himself saw a contradiction there. He also was a father. And his being the president of the church didn't make it unable, make him unable to be a father. Okay, here's another question. As you've studied about the history of Christianity in China, what aspects of Christology have you found to be the most resonant with the non-Westerners, and what aspects seem to be the most difficult to understand? Oh, that's a good question. He's talking specifically about Christology, not about religion. Did they, it say Christology? They, they said Christology in their okay. question, so I think this, that's not what you spoke about, but I think, they, I think your, your bio piqued their interest. Um... Hmm. The thing that most readily comes to mind is kind of the, let me just say it and it'll help me think through this. So the kind of negative, the, the, the gap in Christology that comes to mind is from a kind of cultural Chinese point of view, there's not a really great word for sin. The word for sin, which we currently use in a Christian context in China is zui, which can also mean like guilt or the bad thing you did, or um, a debt, even. Like some kinds of things can be like a... Yeah, so it's like, it's like the guilt or the thing you owe or the bad thing. But it doesn't have this sense of this, you know, terrible moral toxin that drags you down and damns you forever. So, um, the, you know, of course, Latter-day Saints don't really believe in sin in that exact same way either. But... Um, that's a difference. So, I think one of the things that, they, that is really important in the kind of Christology, in the Chinese Christian point of view, is Jesus' power to exercise, to heal, and to command the elements. His kind of charismatic power um, was very important and very resonant in a Chinese cultural context where there's so many different deities out there, so you would worship the deity um, that was able to do things for you and make your life better and protect you. And um, the True Jesus Church, for example, founded by uh, Wei Enbo in 1917, which is very much like our church, but just in China, was popular at the very beginning because of their miracles of healing and tongues mm -hmm. and exorcism that they um, practiced. Okay, our, our time is up, so really, really appreciate your talk and appreciate the extra effort of, of you coming here. I know it was an extra effort on your part to oh. come here today. Thanks so, so much. Thank you very much.